This water bottle right here cost $45 and it is selling out like crazy. Mobs have formed, collections have been built, and an empire over a century in the making has seemingly exploded overnight. This is the Stanley Cup, and it seems like you cannot escape it these days on the internet. But the Stanley Cup is only the tip of the iceberg, and my obsessive brain wanted to dive deep into the world of water bottle culture. I think this is about to be the longest video on my entire channel, so strap in as we talk about why the Stanley Cup is a perfect symbol of modern overconsumption, identity formation through products, viral marketing, and environmental hypocrisy. But let's start from the beginning. And before we do that, if you are new here, hi, I'm Kara, and I make videos on the intersection of money, media, and intentional living. Every other week, at least, I make video essays like this one, exploring how money and culture come together. So if you want to see more videos like this one, check out my whole playlist of other video essays, and be sure to subscribe. And a big thank you to Thrive Market for sponsoring today's video. So let me ask you this, do you live far away from a healthy grocery store, and or are you trying to eat healthier and more ethically? Because if so, Thrive Market could be your perfect perfect fit. Thrive Market is an online membership-based grocery store with guaranteed savings on every order. You can find incredible high-quality foods that are organic and sustainable, and even better, you can filter the food based on your diet and lifestyle. So if you're looking for keto staples and snacks, or you're more into the Mediterranean diet like me, you can actually filter on Thrive Market for items that match exactly that diet. I also absolutely loved that you can filter by certifications like B Corp status, meaning that you can better support businesses that have been vetted for their social, sustainability, and environmental performance. Thrive Market themselves are actually a B Corp, which is super, super cool. That is just one of the reasons I am so excited to partner with Thrive Market because they are a business that really aligns with my personal values of a business that's doing good for you and for the world. Orders that are $49 plus ship free and are delivered with carbon neutral shipping from their zero waste warehouses. Plus for every paid annual membership, Thrive Market donates a free membership to someone in need. Not to mention you save money and time ordering from Thrive Market. They have great savings, they'll match prices if you find a lower price somewhere else, and certain products even have cash back, which are all then delivered to your front door. The other reason I was so excited is because the food options are honestly amazing. I'm personally trying to choose food with fewer preservatives and that are more ethically sourced, and Thrive Market introduced me to so many snacks and brands that I never knew existed. I got some fun food like these cinnamon sugar twists, which are like getting to snack on little churros, but I also got some great pantry staples like these noodles made of chickpeas that have tons of plant-based protein in them, and tofu blocks that I used this week to make myself a stir fry. I even got an eco-friendly stain remover. I cannot speak highly enough of Thrive Market and the ways that they are making healthy living easier and more affordable. So if you're interested in trying out Thrive Market for yourself, you can join Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order, plus a free gift worth up to $60 by using my link thrivemarket.com slash Nicole. That's thrivemarket.com slash Nicole, which I will link down below. Definitely check them out, and thank you so much to Thrive Market for sponsoring today's video. All right, so to start this obsessive water bottle journey, let's first go full English class and explore the symbol of the water bottle. I want one! I want my own army! I want my own planet! I deserve it! I'm just as important as you! The Stanley Cup, which is our culture's current water bottle obsession, is a symbol of a specific type of status, community, and persona, which we'll talk about more in a bit. But I want to do a big old zoom out to think about water bottles as a symbol themselves. Anyone who has seen my videos before knows that I love thinking way too deeply about things, so entertain me for a second as I go on my spiel. Water is at the center of human life, and our societies have long been structured around water itself. Our oldest cities were built on waterways, our religious ceremonies often involve water, and water was even one of the four elements of Avatar The Last Airbender, so obviously lots of cultural relevance. And let's not forget humans are 70% water, which means we are basically this medium hairy walking water bottle. And yes, I am very sorry for putting that image in your head, truly. 
So water sits at this intersection of human life and culture in so many ways, which makes it fitting that water bottles have become a modern accessory that reflects the deeper human trends we're facing right now, with materialism, social media, and microtrends. I'd argue that water bottles are used these days as a way to express oneself. They subliminally send a message about who we are, what we value, and what we enjoy, in the same way that a designer bag or a certain car might convey messages about the owner. By the way, if you haven't seen my How Designer Brands Keep You Poor video, go check out that one after this video. But water bottles weren't always seen as an accessory the way that they are today. However, they do have a fascinatingly close tie to marketing throughout history. See, water bottles, aka something that will hold water for you to drink on the go, have been around since early human civilization. But shockingly, they did not have Dasani or Stanley cups back in ancient Egypt, and instead, water bottles were made in ancient societies from glass to ceramic to animal skin. As JustBottle.co explains in their brief history of the water bottle, the water bottle industry became, well, an industry soon after 1622 when the UK's holy well was being bottled for its supposed healing properties. People would travel from all over to visit the holy well, and for those who couldn't travel, just like the smart shovel sellers of the gold rush, entrepreneurs stepped in to bottle holy well water and then transport the bottled water via horse-drawn carriages to sell. Thus, we have our first documented moment of the commercialization of water. This only ramped up in the centuries to come with a larger rise and spread of commercial water bottles and sparkling water. But as public water infrastructure improved and tap water became safer, we started seeing a new rise in reusable water bottles in the 20th century, with popular plastic brands like Nalgene, and of course, nowadays, we see the stainless steel water bottles dominating the scene with brands like Stanley and Hydro Flasks. Okay, I know, too much history, but I just wanted to paint the scene for you guys, you know? History is a long and continuous story, one in which we are not in the final chapter, and I think that's important to call out for two reasons. For one, it helps us color and contextualize the way that we think about water bottles bottle culture today. It didn't just appear out of nowhere. There's a long history of its commercialization and iterations, and the way we've interacted with water bottles, both reusable and disposable, has been closely connected to marketing. But two, I think it's important to recognize that the story is still being written, and that we have the power to control what's written next. The water bottle culture that we see today is just one part of a larger conversation around overconsumption, and I'm an optimist, so I think that we don't have to accept that as our reality. But I am getting ahead of myself here because I first want to talk about how water bottle culture that we are seeing today is emerging as a form of symbolic consumption, which is when we use products and brands to construct and communicate ideas about ourselves. Marketing and customization are the tools that have enabled this new form of consumption to grow so strong, and the Stanley water bottles are once again a perfect encapsulation of this phenomenon. Look at these Stanleys. This one matches my outfit. So we're gonna buy it. A major reason Stanley Cups blew up so much in 2023 was because they leaned into the customization aspect of their brand. You're not stuck choosing a single type of Stanley Cup, because now you can choose the exact styles that match your vibe. Nowadays, you can even find accessories and add-ons for your Stanley Cup to further customize. And when Stanley's new leadership, the same guy who made Crocs come back to the mainstream, new colors were released, limited editions were dropped, and even collaborations collaborations with famous artists were launched. And if you've seen any videos about the Stanley Cup craze, you're probably already familiar with the insane Valentine's Day Stanley Cup collection mob that formed at Target's. I mean, look at this. Folks were running through Target to get their hands on red and pink cups. Some people were even fighting and taking the Stanley Cups by the fistful. Like guys, I know they're cute, but how much water can one person drink? A wild sight, my friends, truly wild, but a great representation of how manufactured scare can be really powerful on top of symbolic consumption through customization. And on one hand, there is an argument for how it's a positive thing in this world that we have this level of customization. It's a good thing that we're able to efficiently produce products on a global scale, but I do worry that we are putting way too much meaning behind the choices we make for our water bottles, which makes it easier for us to justify hyperconsumption in the name of identity formation, while also making it easier for microtrends to appear. Because we ourselves are not static beings, right? Our personalities and our interests, they change over time. So why would our water bottles look the same? They should be changing with us too, right? 
And honestly, not even over time. Yes, maybe some people have gone from being a Hydro Flask girl in their teens to being a Stanley Cup girl in their 20s, with the changing aesthetics of their water bottles reflecting the internal changes they're feeling as they get older. More mature, more classy, whatever other attribute we want to assign to a metal cup. But arguably even more prevalent is the changing of water bottle aesthetics and customization on a daily basis based on moods or preferences. Basically, picking a different Stanley Cup or water bottle based on what type of person you want to present as that day. Are you a neutral aesthetic today, or maybe a pop of color? These can sometimes just be a matter of matching with your outfit, but I'd argue it's deeper than that. Picking out our Stanley cup or water bottle in the morning, just like picking out our outfit, is a way we feel like we can assert control over our identity and interactions with the external world. An interesting way I think about this desire to reflect and identify ourselves through our purchases is through Maslow's hierarchy of needs. For my non-psychology buffs out there, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is this pyramid framework of what we as humans need, starting with the basics of food, water, and shelter, and rising to safety, belonging, esteem, and eventually self-actualization. Well, for many of us watching, we live in societies with economies of scale. Getting clean water is no longer difficult, nor are bottles for that water. So we can now move past the physiological needs of a product and perhaps go as far as using the product to help us reach self-actualization and find belonging. I think that's part of why water bottle culture, just like any subculture that is born of aesthetics or products, is in fact a culture. People feel connected to each other with these products. They feel like they're part of a community, an inside joke, a tribe. This water bottle also fits in the cup holder, and it's cheetah print. You love cheetah print. Cheetah print is now chuggy. That is they not Abby. It looks exactly the same. Look at this size difference on this thing. I know it sounds kind of ridiculous to say that people feel this sense of community if they have a certain kind of water bottle or even just certain kind of color, but honestly, is it that different than being part of a fandom and having shirts from it or being really into limited time drops of shoes and talking about it with other shoe heads? The products give us this visual way to show that we're part of something bigger than ourselves and allows us to identify other members of that in-group. I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong, but I do think it's worth considering how we might be using the purchasing of products to fulfill a sense of belonging and then better understand ourselves. We're going to be telling you today what your Stanley color means about you. Let's get started. And side note, this is not just in the reusable water bottle space. I have also seen this in the disposable water bottle space. I've actually always thought disposable water bottle marketing was like the purest form of marketing you could find because the product is basically all the same. The majority of bottled water is actually just repurposed tap water. And yet there are so many options that each have their unspoken subculture. From the Fiji water people who I imagine to be these posh rich people who fill their fridges with only Fiji water, to the boxed water people, which I imagine is for people who are more of hippies, to the rise of liquid death water, which is like the hip cool dude thing to have these days in the bottled water world, or should I say canned water world. And liquid death in particular benefits from the same thing that has made Stanley Cup so successful, viral marketing. Viral marketing, like its name suggests, is a strategy where information or a product spreads through social media and or word of mouth. In the case of liquid death, the gimmick punk branding, a tagline of murder your thirst, and just the name Liquid Death itself is ripe for virality. It's fun, it sparks conversation, and the counterculture vibes make for the foundation of a great community feel. Evident by the fact that people are out here getting Liquid Death tattoos. As Liquid Death's co-founder Mike Cesario explains, quote, at the core of Liquid Death is that we're a brand that wants to make really funny, entertaining stuff on the internet. And that has paid off, because now they are a brand with millions of followers across social media, and it's really elevated liquid death to be more than just a water can company. It's a movement. And the same thing goes for the Stanley Cup craze. I mentioned this before, but one of the genius moves that Stanley Cups had was treating Stanley Cups like their shoe launches with these limited editions and these collabs. This plus their range of fun colors and iconic look led to a flood of videos online. This only grew more with the now famous car fire video that was viewed over 95 million times on TikTok. I mentioned this in my de-influencing video where I covered Stanley Cups, but that video showed a 
woman whose car caught on fire, and yet the ice in the Stanley Cup was still there. The president of Stanley responded by sending the woman Stanley Cups and a brand new car, which then also went viral. A double whammy of virality that made the brand explode even more. This is gonna sound like such an old lady thing for me to say, I know, but the internet is powerful. And yes, I just cringed saying that. But it's true. So much modern culture building is done online, and platforms like TikTok and YouTube, these are the town squares. Memes are part of the conversation that documents trends, which we can see in just the recent history of popular water bottle culture. From the Visco Girl meme who always has her hydro flask on her, to the Yeti people with their boat shoes, we can't talk about water bottle culture without acknowledging the way that social media has enabled it to happen. And similarly, we cannot talk about water bottle culture without talking about the environment. After all, reusable water bottles were supposed to be our secret weapon in the war against the disposable plastic water bottles that were clogging our landfills and lakes. But as evidenced by the growing collections of water bottles we see today, water bottle culture has shown us how even good things can become excessive. The New York Times wrote a piece last year about how we're water bottle freaks, and an important insight stuck out to me. Quote, Americans are drinking a lot of water, but they're on the fence about how best to do it. More than $2 billion in reusable water bottles were sold in the United States in 2022, up from around $1.5 billion in 2020. And yet, they also mentioned that single servicing water bottle sales are also up. As the article succinctly puts it, quote, consumers are spending billions of dollars a year on reusable water bottles to stay hydrated and then buying bottled water anyway, even as faucet water remains free. I mentioned this before, but reports show that over half of bottled water is just coming from tap water. So the whole bottled water is cleaner argument doesn't hold up in a lot of cases. The eco-friendly plot seems to have been a little lost, with people even taking bottled water, pouring it into their reusable water bottle, and then throwing away the disposable one. On top of that, the popularity of water bottle collections, so not just having one or two that you switch out when the other is being washed, has also kind of defeated the environmentally conscious purpose of the reusable water bottle in the first place. Like the old saying goes, reduce, reuse, and recycle. The first word of that trio being the most important. Reducing means cutting back on the goods and materials that we're consuming. So instead of buying an army of water bottles, maybe just one is needed. Or even using the free ones we're given. Because I don't know about you guys, but I genuinely cannot remember the last time that I bought a reusable water bottle. In part because companies just love giving away water bottles as company swag. Like this one that I use here, my dad won at an event and then he gave to me. And now it's my go-to and it's kind of all that I need. So I just just have this one. But this paradox of the reusable water bottle isn't all that surprising when we zoom out and realize that we do a lot of the same environmental hypocrisy when it comes to our consumer demands and then our desire for more sustainability. Like we say we're interested in sustainability, but we don't always back that up with our purchasing habits. Harvard Business Review did a great breakdown of this phenomenon in their article on the elusive green consumer, writing, quote, in one recent survey, 65% said they wanna buy purpose-driven brands that advocate sustainability, yet only about 26% actually do so. Now, it is important to call out that oftentimes purchasing more sustainable things is going to cost more. Not always, but a lot of times. So I don't think that's a completely fair data point since a lot of folks are on tight budgets. Now, could some people probably buy fewer of things if they're buying in excess and then take some of that money and buy it more ethically and sustainably? Probably. But the nice thing about reducing overall, so say buying one water bottle instead of buying an army of water bottles is that you're purely saving yourself money while also helping the environment. The fewer consumer demands we put out there, the fewer water bottles that are going to be produced down the road. And production of materials is an important thing to keep in mind here, because I think it's easy to look at, say, a Stanley Cup stand at Target and sort of forget all it took to get the bottles there. Not gonna lie, when I shop, it's easy to imagine that the products around me just appeared, they operated, it's magic. But that magic has an environmental cost. As Wired writes in their article, The Big problem with the giant Stanley Cup, quote, in 2009, the New York Times reported that when compared to plastic, the production of stainless steel bottles requires seven times the amount of fossil fuels, emits 14 times more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and requires hundreds of times more metal resources. Now, this wouldn't be a problem if we bought something like a Stanley Cup or Hydro Flask once and used it for life. I mean, those things are durable as hell. Like I mentioned in my de-influencing the internet's most viral products video, your Hydro Flask could probably 
probably outlive you and then be your urn after you die. But our modern water bottle culture encourages buying multiple water bottles based on trends, moods, aesthetics, and memes. This is the same thing we see with plastic bags at grocery stores. I'd argue there's been a demonization of plastic grocery bags in the past decade, and instead people are opting for paper bags or tote bags. But those only work as environmentally conscious options if we are reusing the heck out of those paper and cotton bags. Quote, for a paper bag to neutralize its environmental impact compared to plastic, it would have to be used anywhere from 3 to 43 times. Since paper bags are the least durable of all the bagging options, it's unlikely that a person would get enough use out of any one bag to even out the environmental impact. And the same thing goes for tote bags, even worse actually. Quote, cotton bags have to be reused 131 times before they reduce their impact on climate change to the same extent as plastic bags. To have a comparable environmental footprint, which encompasses climate change as well as other environmental effects, to plastic bags, a cotton bag potentially has to be used thousands of times. And yet, what is another thing we tend to own in bulk? Tote bags. Like water bottle culture, tote bag culture is its own universe full of micro trends and symbolic consumption. They can be used to display community and express personality. It's actually pretty crazy how often this happens when you start thinking about it, from our phones to our plushies to our makeup brands. Which brings me to my final piece on water bottle culture. Water bottle culture, which I've been obsessively thinking thinking about for the past week as I've been writing this video, captures a lot of fascinating aspects of human life and behavior. From our desire to have community, expression, and arguably self-actualization, to the ways we interact and respond to a modern media ecosystem that our primate brains were never designed to handle. But I think water bottle culture also captures this really important relationship between wants and needs. Which I know sounds obvious, but I want to focus on this part and call it out last because I think this is a really actionable part for us. So in water bottle culture, we need water to survive. But at what point does the pursuit move past a need and become a want? And not just a want, but an excessive want that ends up hurting ourselves and others. I do not think that wants are a bad thing at all, and I think we are really lucky to live in a world where we can engage and fulfill a lot of our wants. But we also have to think about the financial and environmental burden we take on with trends like this. Like I said at the start of this video, just one Stanley Cup is $45. Have a small collection and you're looking at hundreds of dollars now, plus a trail of waste that'll be out of style in a year or two. If we try staying on this hamster wheel of always keeping up with the latest water bottle trend, we are always going to be running. And yes, the water bottle is indeed a metaphor. But I don't want us to feel like we are constantly restricting ourselves when it comes to water bottle culture or tote bag culture or whatever other forms of consumption that we pursue. Pure restriction or anti-consumption aren't my goals, but instead for us to become more conscious consumers. I want us to be able to better weigh whether another $45 water bottle might be better used on a dinner with friends or paying toward our retirement or saving up for a weekend getaway. Microtrends and FOMO are really powerful forces, but I think returning to that balance between our wants and our needs is a really good way to combat those powerful forces. So that maybe one day, water bottle culture is just drinking out of a beautifully ordinary cup that we've had for years. But what do you think? Do you think that water bottle culture is here to last? And if so, where does it go from here? Let me know your thoughts on the deep dive and what topics you'd like to see me cover next in the comments below. I had a lot of fun writing this video. I hope you guys enjoyed watching it. Hope you didn't get bored out of your minds, but Either way, I had a good time. Thank you so much to the patrons on Patreon for supporting this channel and those who donate on Buy Me A Coffee. I appreciate you guys so, so much. Thank you again for watching. Thank you Thrive Market for sponsoring this video and I will see you guys next time. Bye.